Think about real world situations where we hear things. Sometimes there's a single sound for us to perceive, like our phone going off when we're laying in bed trying to fall asleep or listening to the voice of someone when you're conversing in an otherwise empty and quiet room. But in lots of situations, we're hearing many things all at once. Think about conversing with a friend in a crowded bar or on a busy street, or even just listening to some live music by a band. In a case like that, we're talking about multiple different sound sources. You know, maybe a guitar, vocals, and a keyboard, but they might all be coming to us, hitting our ears at the same time. What enters our ears is not three, distri- three distinct streams of sound waves, but rather a super complex mix of sound combining all of those inputs. So how do we so naturally and easily hear or perceive the three different things rather than just a combined like nonsensical blur of sound? That's actually been studied quite thoroughly by a sensation and perception psychologist, and those researchers have documented some patterns in how our brain treats complicated auditory scenes, some rules the brain seems to follow in order to segregate a complex stream of sound into distinct streams that we perceive separately. So there seem to be certain grouping principles. You might think of these as kind of heuristics, shortcuts, that the brain uses to segregate complex sounds into distinct sources that make us perceive them as distinct sources. So I'll give you a few examples of those that have been well studied. One would be onset time. So if you think about it, different sources of sound tend to start at different times. Even just fractions of a second later, we can tell the difference. Oh, this this source started a little later. That can help us distinguish them. Uh, Location is another principle. So a single sound source tends to come from one location or at the very least kind of move continuously. If something is off to my left and I'm hearing sounds coming from off to the left and it's continuously off to my left and then suddenly I'm hearing some sounds from my right, that's probably a different source. It's some other source of sound, right? It's unlikely that something just teleported over to my right all of a sudden. Another cue that the brain seems to use, another grouping principle would be similarity of pitch or relatedly like similarity of timbre. Um, So you can think of this like, you know, flutes have a high pitch range, right? Trombones have a low pitch range. They kind of go together. So it's easy to tell if there's a flute and a trombone playing at the same time. We can tell that all the sort of high notes are coming from the flute and maybe those lower notes are coming from the trombone. We experience it as two separate streams of sound, two separate sources of sound. Another cue the brain seems to use is proximity and time. So you can think of this as like sounds that occur in rapid succession usually are coming from the same source. If something's all kind of together, all happening together, then it's like, oh, that that might have come from the same thing, the same source, right? Or another one, and again, I won't go through all these, but just another one to give you a feel for it would be continuity. The principle of continuity says sounds that stay constant or that change smoothly, like it's going up, going up, going up, going up at the same rate. Uh, those usually would be the same sound source, right? It's unlikely that one thing would be kind of going up, going up, going up, and then some totally separate sound source somewhere else would start at where that one left off and also be going up at exactly the same speed, right? So there are others, but these are the big ones. Basically, by following some combination of these sorts of rules, these heuristics or principles, the brain, and again, it's doing this automatically behind the scenes, but the brain can pretty accurately detect which parts of a complicated sound stream are coming from distinct sources. In other words, it can split up or segregate that stream of sound so we can tell what's what. Now, we can actually demonstrate these principles in experiments and in everyday situations. We'll, We'll hear some demos as we go here. Just for example, to get us started, to see how the brain uses something like similarity of pitch and proximity in time, we might look at Bach's choral prelude. So Bach was a master of using these perceptual heuristics in order to play with his listener's experience. In his choral prelude, he had one instrument playing, one instrument jumping from high to low notes in quick succession, which gets perceived by the listener as two separate auditory streams, like a stream of high notes and separately a stream of low notes. What we've drawn in purple here and what we've drawn in blue here sounds to the listener as if it's being played by two separate sources, so to speak, even though it's all the same instrument, the same source. So it's him using that heuristic in our brain to make us experience it that way. Now, if it's played slowly, the effect doesn't work. If it's played slowly, it's perceived accurately as just a single stream where the person is bouncing high, low, high, low, or high, low, high, low, right? They don't get 
the the high notes don't all get grouped together in their own stream, nor are the low notes all grouped together in their stream. The same effect has actually been demonstrated experimentally. So a classic study from the 70s showed this. In the first condition, what I've got on the left here, they did a slow alternation between high and low notes. And here there's, there's no illusion, the brain doesn't kick in and use any sort of heuristic to group the notes together into separate streams. It's just gonna be perceived as one single stream of sound that goes high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. You can kind of see the stream people experience by those dotted lines, it's all one stream. But if we do it quickly, if you bounce back and forth, high note and then very quickly a low note and then very quickly back to a high note and then very quickly back to a low note, it, with a sort of rapid alternation, it's perceived as two separate streams. As you can see on the right here, the dotted green line is what people actually experience, what they perceive. So it's the same six notes as on the left, but notice how it's experienced as two separate streams. The notes get grouped due to things like similarity of pitch and proximity in time, and also then, yeah, the, there's like a continuity there as it's going down at the same rate. So I'll play you an example to make this more clear. You can experience the effect for yourself. So let me play this demo. Demonstration one, stream segregation in a cycle of six tones. You will hear a cycle consisting of three high tones interleaved with three low ones. First it is played slowly, then quickly. At the high speed, the high and low tones segregate into separate streams. So you may have noticed in the second part there on the right that there are sort of two different streams you can pay attention to or focus on. It sounds like two separate sets of notes happening at the same time, almost like two instruments playing sort of. So basically distinct pitches are perceived as two different streams, at least if things are happening close together in time. In other words, when a lot of info is coming in quick, the brain uses similarity of pitch as a grouping principle to group sounds into different streams or sources to make sense of it. Now, we have no problem ignoring distracting sounds if what we're listening to is all of a similar pitch, like my friend's voice, right? My friend's voice all has the same basic pitch versus other background sounds, right? If my friend has a really low you know, male voice, then maybe it's easy to, to focus on his voice if everyone else around has like, you know, uh, higher pitched voices. But if there's a lot of overlap in the frequencies, overlap in the pitches, like background sounds have a lot of the same frequencies, I can't group based on similarity of pitch as easily in order to track my friend's voice. And we'll hear a demonstration of that here. Demonstration two, pattern recognition within and across perceptual streams. First, you will hear a standard cycle containing three tones and three silences. Then three additional notes replace the silences to form a six-tone cycle in which three tones are high in frequency and three are low. The three and six-tone patterns are alternated twice. Try to continue to hear the three-tone standard in the six-tone cycle. In part one, the tones of the standard are all from the high range. So you're probably able, you can always go back and rewind and try this again, but you're probably able to hear that standard, in other words, the thing you were hearing here by itself, you were probably still able to hear that stream, that separate stream, even when there was that distracting background information going on, because the distractor, the background noise, the distractor was such a different pitch, so, so different in frequency, that it's very easy for your brain to track those as two separate sources, and you can focus on that the, the thing they wanted you to focus on. But now let's finish this out and we'll do the, the version on the right where there's more overlap. So uh, in this next one, we're gonna see what happens when the distractors aren't so distinct in pitch. In part two, two tones of the standard are high and one low. Judge whether the standard can be heard more or less clearly than in part one.
It was likely a lot harder to keep track of that black stream, right? The thing you're trying to pay attention to, a lot harder to keep track of that and ignore the distractor stuff if that distractor stuff is so similar in pitch, right? The brain can no longer use similarity of pitch to group things together and keep track of the stream you're trying to focus on. So that shows the importance of like how different uh, pitches can help the brain group things together. Similarity of pitch uh, also can sort of capture different streams into one and the effect the best example of that is called galloping there's another example of how our brain is just automatically going to follow a similar in pitch rule uh if we if we play a sequence of the same note so like we've got here in in red right the same note being played and then maybe a sequence of notes climbing a scale like what we've got in blue here um, then what's going to happen is we'll, we'll clearly perceive it as distinct streams. We'll clearly, you can kind of see the perception of what we'll get at the bottom here. They're, they're clearly uh, perceived as two, two separate streams, no problem. But that's up until they get similar in pitch, right? When they get the reality of the actual physical stimulus, they start getting frequencies that are pretty similar. Then suddenly the similar in pitch rule kicks in and the perception we have is this is all the same stream. This is all one single stream. And what you generally experience is what people describe as a galloping pattern where the tones sort of jump back and forth quickly together. So when they get far enough away again, right, when the sounds actually are different in frequency again, then it becomes easy for the brain to, to hear them as two separate streams. It, it no longer groups them, right? It'll, it'll uh, recognize the, the distinct sources. Um, so let's hear an example of that one. So I could play out and hear an example of that one in a demo. So again, with far away pitches or far away frequencies, like we've got here on the left, they'll be perceived as two separate streams, especially again, when we play these rapidly is when it'll be very easy to tell them different. So the first part here on the left will show that uh, it, it'll, it'll speed up, right? So they're gonna start it slow, it won't be as obvious, but as it speeds up, as it gets fast, you'll likely have no problem hearing two different streams you can focus on. Some high beeps that just keep going high beeps, and then some low beeps separately that you can focus on as a different stream. So let's play that out. Demonstration three, loss of rhythmic information as a result of stream segregation. You will hear a cycle of two high tones and one low tone in a galloping pattern. Listen to what happens to the experience of the gallop as we speed up the sequence by shortening the tones. First, the tones are far apart in frequency. The left side. So you probably could hear that as just a bunch of high beeps as one stream and some low beeps in the background you could focus on separately as a different stream. But now when we put them close together with similarity of pitch, the brain automatically is going to group them together. Again, as soon as that gets kind of rapid enough that it's not obvious when it's going to get kind of close together in time. So they'll start slow and then they'll speed this up. And what you'll notice is it starts to combine these. They become the same stream and you'll get that galloping effect. Next, the frequency separation is small. So it's much harder to hear that. You're much less likely to hear that as two separate streams, a bunch of high beeps and then separately low beeps here just combined together. Your brain just automatically and unconsciously says, I'm gonna lump that together due to that similarity of pitch. Um, another example would be the scale illusion. This is one uh, demonstrated by a series of studies from the 70s onward. What they did was play a different sequence into each ear. So people are wearing headphones. You can play different sounds to each ear. So the top two rows here, what we've got on the right, these top two rows, you can see it's what's played into the right ear and the left ear. Uh, it's you know blue notes all come in the left headphone, red notes all come in the right headphone. 
but what people perceive, what they hear when we play these sequences through those headphones is what's on the bottom two rows here. So listeners perceive it as two smooth sequences that are grouped by similarity of pitch, despite the fact that the notes hitting are hitting completely different ears. So this is an actually, actually an example where similarity of pitch cue kind of overrides another cue, the location cue that we mentioned. And this illusion works, it kind of makes sense, because usually similar pitches, especially those going smoothly in the same direction, come from the same source. It's the best way to make sense of that info the brain's getting, even though in this case they're being played in separate ears and should be perceived as two separate sound streams, this stream and this stream. That's not how the brain groups it. Uh, we can also demonstrate the continuity principle I mentioned earlier in the lab. A good way to show this is to play a tone, but put some pauses in there. So you can see a couple example setups here. Either have the tone smoothly go up and then pause and then smoothly go down and then pause and keep doing that up and down with pauses. Or you could simply do a tone, then pause, and play a tone, then pause, play a tone, then pause. When you do this, people hear the reality of it just fine. They perceive things accurately, no problem. But what happens if during those pauses, we add some background noise? What if there's some background noise, some distractors going on? So in the lab, what we could do is we could just add some white noise during those pauses and see what happens. Turns out, if we fill in that gap with background noise, kind of like we're in a crowded, noisy place like a bar, what'll happen is the brain will fill in the gaps. It actually invents an auditory experience. It perceives sound that isn't there, a tone that's not there during the pauses. So the brain is actually perceiving the tone as continuous and unpaused, kind of in the background behind that noise. It's as if the tone doesn't turn off at all, even though we did indeed pause the tone. So the brain is hallucinating the sound, like we're perceiving sound that's not really there because of the continuity principle that the brain automatically follows. It expects continuity. Let's hear an example of that. Let's actually hallucinate together without needing shrooms or anything. In this one, they're gonna do the left setup first. It's just a tone with a silent pause in the middle. And then they'll do the right side situation where they, they put some noise filling in the gap, okay? So it'll be very obvious the tone is playing and there's a gap and they'll, they'll add a little noise. They'll actually start the noise very quiet and they'll keep playing this over and over, but they'll, they'll turn the noise up louder and louder and louder. And at some point, what'll probably happen is you'll start to hallucinate the filled in, you'll fill in, you'll start to, to hear the tone as if it's continuous and unbroken with no pauses, as if like your brain will experience the tone happening behind the scene, behind the noise. Now, just FYI, make sure your speakers or headphones aren't cranked up super high for this one. At a normal level, it shouldn't be too loud even when they get that noise very loud. So here we go. Demonstration 28, apparent continuity. Before playing this demonstration, please read the warning about loudness level in the booklet. We present a tone alternating with a silence. Then the silence is replaced by a soft white noise. After each group of cycles, the noise is increased in intensity. In the final group, the spectrum level of the noise is the same as that of the tone. At this setting, the tone seems continuous behind the noise. By the end there, it probably sounded like the tone was just going continuously without stopping. That's continuity principle. Uh, let's hear another example of the continuity principle. Um, adding connecting information, that's going to make even distinct pitches, like high and low pitches, they're different. Uh, with the connecting information, right, it'll, it'll add continuity, so it'll make them seem like they come from the same source. You can kind of track it here. It's all one source, right? But without that continuity, those same pitches, those same sounds being that far apart in pitch are going to be perceived as two separate streams. So the first part of this one, the left situation, you'll likely experience as one stream of sound where it zooms high, then low, then high, then low, then high, then low. But for the second part, the right situation, you'll likely experience it as two separate streams, some higher pitched beeps that go together, which you can focus on, or some lower pitched beeps that go together, which you can focus on. So let's hear that now. Demonstration 12. 
effects of connectedness on segregation. A cycle is formed of two high frequency tones interleaved with two low ones. In the first sequence, consecutive tones are connected by a frequency transition. In the second, the frequency transitions are omitted. Decide which one shows the greatest streaming. So even though the first one you might at times have experienced it as the two high beeps going beep, 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 and the two low beeps going, but like it's hard for your brain not to slip into experiencing it as woo, 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 woo. Whereas in that second combination, sorry for that, and the second combination, the second part of that, it's much easier for your brain, much more automatic. You're much more likely to experience it as a couple high pitch sounds, a couple high pitch beeps going together and a separate stream of low pitch beeps. All right. And then uh, another example, I'll just do this one last one, would be like onset time, the onset time principle that I talked about. We can show it in the lab by, say, playing three, three frequencies, three harmonics of the same fundamental frequency. So, you know, all multiples of 440. Uh, but maybe what we do is we have one of them start earlier and later. It, it'll actually get perceived as a distinct sound stream to listeners. So in the, in the example here, if we'd played this in the lab, all three of these frequencies, right, they're multiples of 440 hertz, they're all spaced 440 hertz apart. So if they all came on at the exact same time, we, we know we would definitely hear it as a single complex tone with a fundamental frequency of 440 hertz, right? But in fact, if we set it up in the lab like this, where we start just a little bit earlier for one of those components, the brain assumes that's not part of the complex tone that those other two pieces are forming. So the brain hears a pure tone of 880 hertz as one stream, and then a separate stream with a fundamental of 440 hertz that starts a little later. So that would be due to onset time. The brain tracks if sounds start at slightly different times, they're probably not part of the same sound. They're probably not the exact same source. Anyway, those are just some examples to give you a feel for some of the grouping principles the brain seems to use to help chop up or segregate a complex clusterfuck of sounds into distinct streams we can make sense of, like distinct voices or distinct instruments, or hearing a cat meow and an alarm clock as two different things, even if the the even if they, they happen at the same time, if they both flood into our ears at the same time all mixed up together. So don't worry too much about all the specific grouping principles, but the idea behind them is really important. It's something we'll, we'll return to later, especially with um, the visual sense, when we talk about gestalt principles, gestalt perception. It's all about being able to take some complex, realistic, real world scene like that and break it up into pieces that, that the brain can make sense of, that we can recognize as separate parts. Now, before we move on, I wanted to briefly revisit a topic from the previous video where we talked about cochlear implants. I mentioned that they're, they're not as high fidelity as the cochlea itself normally is, though usually good enough. The cochlear implant system works by taking all the complex realities of continuous frequency information picked up by the microphone and simplifies it down to some discrete set of frequencies. It also discards some fine structured temporal information and this can make stream segregation challenging for users. We'll actually simulate the effects here in a demo. So in simple conditions, we'll do simple conditions first. In simple conditions without background noise, we can still do okay, segregate streams out, hear what someone's saying, even when, when limited to the kinds of info that a cochlear implant would give the user. So even when simulating the cochlear implant, we'll probably be able to hear okay. And then after that, I want you to notice for the last part of the demo, how much harder it'll be in complex conditions with background noise, like multiple conversations occurring at once. So first we'll do the easy situation. I'll play a sentence as it might sound with a cochlear implant, but without any distracting background noise. So can you understand this sentence? Big dogs can be dangerous. Okay, I'll play it one more time. Big dogs can be dangerous. 
you probably caught it without problem. And so in simple situations, even someone with a cochlear implant would be able to hear no problem. But here's the original sound in case you didn't quite get it. Here's the original sound. Big dogs can be dangerous. So you're saying big dogs can be dangerous. And again, we can pick that up if there's not a lot of distracting background information. But now we'll simulate the, the cochlear implant, but we're gonna simulate more real world conditions where maybe someone with a cochlear implant might be listening to their friend and trying to ignore a background conversation. So can you understand this sentence? The team's linguist and graphology expert sat in her own room hunched. Let me try that one more time. The team's linguist and graphology expert sat in her own room hunched. So there are two conversations kind of going on there, but the same sentence was actually in the background. The, it was still saying big dogs can be dangerous, but with another sentence at the same time. And that's really hard, especially if I hadn't already primed you with the correct answer. It's really hard for people to hear one of those or to focus on one of those uh, without the other one making it kind of confusing. So uh, usually the cochlea, the, the sort of natural cochlea, can segregate those streams out no problem. But with a cochlear implant, some of those subtleties are lost. So the brain can't as easily use its grouping principles and stream segregation becomes really hard. So here's the original sound, that, that confusing one that was really hard. Here's what we actually did you know, without the cochlear implant simulation. The team's linguist Big and graphology expert dangerous. sat in her own room hunched. So the team's linguist and graphology expert sat hunched over something like that. And then there's also big dogs can be dangerous in the background. So here it again, you'll probably be able to segregate out those two streams. The team's linguist and graphology expert sat in her own room hunched. One more time. The team's linguist and graphology expert sat in her own room hunched. So that's not too hard. I mean, it's, you know, a little pain in the ass. You have to pay attention to one or the other, but it's we can do it. It's much harder to do if you've got the realities of like a cochlear implant where it's simplified away, where we lost some of that subtle information that the brain normally uses to do stream segregation. In other words, things like those grouping principles. Okay. That's the end of the main audition material for now, though before we move on, I wanted to fulfill a promise from earlier and come back to explain that weird auditory illusion from an early video. Remember that tone that seemed to go up and up and up and up and up infinitely? Or you may have heard other versions in pop culture like musical remixes. Here's an example. Up, it just seems to go up forever or even in like video games like Mario 64 they've got a version of it that's kind of entertaining So you get the idea. It goes on for like 10 minutes and it still sounds the whole time like it's going up, going up, going up, going up, but never seems to actually get anywhere. So how the heck does that illusion work? It's actually called a shepherd tone after psychologist Roger Shepard. And basically it's made up of simultaneous sounds that are an octave apart. So kind of three separate streams in a simple version like, like I'm showing here, three separate streams where each of those streams is, is going up in frequency. It is climbing in frequency. So they're, they're kind of overlapping ascending scales played at the same time. They each rise in frequency gradually. And then in turn, as they get to the highest frequency, they'll actually jump back down. So this one will jump back down. Once it reaches the highest pitch, it actually goes down to a much lower pitch. So why don't we hear it go back down and start over? The key for this illusion is that each tone is also changing volume. It's getting louder as it starts rising again and then softer before it resets. So softer and softer and softer before it goes back down quietly to restart. So we don't hear that as easily. We're more focused on the loud noises of the ones that are in the, the climbing, climbing, climbing part of it. So it starts getting 
you know, louder and louder and louder again as it comes up from the bottom. And that's the part our brain focuses on sort of getting quiets back down as it resets. And that's enough to give us the illusion that it's constantly climbing, constantly climbing, because the part that we're hearing that the loudest part, the part we're most focused on is actually the part that's constantly climbing. We just don't hear the reset in the background. Anyway, that's the end of audition. Our next topic is going to be a shorter one because I want to just get us all on the same page with a bit of a primer or perhaps a refresher for some of you on the very basics of how neurons work and some basics of the brain. So if this stuff's familiar to you, perhaps it'll just serve as a nice review or clarification. But after that one, the next major topic will be somatosensation, which is basically touch and the like.